Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for this event on the Black Policy Agenda for 2022. Uh, we are thrilled to have all of you here this morning. Um, on a, we're going to be talking about a variety of really interesting and important topics. Uh, I want to just start by saying that race has been central to the, the national conversation over the last two years. And of course, this year it's continuing. It's been central to uh, social, political, national security, economic discussions and action. And all of that has been happening against the backdrop of continuing racism, discrimination, police violence, uh, and a yawning racial wealth gap, as well as a continuing pandemic that has been devastating for Black families. So we have a very meaty agenda today, uh, and we're going to be delving into a range of those issues, uh, everything from the Supreme Court pick to the NFL. So before we start, um, let me briefly introduce our panelists. We have Dr. Rayshawn Ray, who's a senior fellow in governance studies, uh, Dr. Keon Gilbert, who's a David L. Rubenstein fellow in governance studies, uh, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, uh, senior fellow and director of uh, Cent, uh, Center for uh, Technology Innovation in Governance Studies, and Dr. Andre Perry, Senior Fellow in the Metro Program. So we're going to uh, get started with the news that President Biden will have the opportunity to nominate a Black woman for the Supreme Court. There are several eminently qualified candidates, as we all know, and this moment is really interesting because uh, this issue is highly political, it's highly gendered, and in so many ways raises questions about employment equity and the importance of the judiciary, judiciary in a very unequal and discriminatory US. So Rishan, um, I'd like you to give us your thoughts about, you know, what does, you know, what does this particular moment, you know, the choice of a Supreme Court uh, pick, uh, what does the national conversation on this choice tell us about the challenges and the opportunities of pursuing anti-racist policies at the federal level? So what's the importance of this pick to an overall uh, discussion in, in the U.S.? Yeah, well, th thanks, Camille. It's always great to be with you um, and our Brookings colleagues here. I can't wait to hear what all they have to say about a range of topics that we're going to discuss today. So I think when it comes to the SCOTUS pick, there are a few sides to this. First, there's the political side, there's the racial side and the intersectional side, race and gender, as you noted, and then the continuous and equitable side of society. When it comes to the political side, we've been here before. If we go back to the 1980s, one of the things that was written in the Washington Post was about then President Ronald Reagan, who was, str who was striving to actually refute charges of his insensitive nature related to women's rights. And of course, there was some history here because previously uh, Reagan had appointed three people to the state Supreme Court during his eight years of governor of California, all of whom were men. So one of his uh, kind of chief advisors said, this will be a quote, good political move for you to nominate a woman. And of course, that woman was Sandra Day O'Connor who was highly qualified and should have been in that position. And of course, there should have been women in those positions before. So accordingly, that political side, we've been here before. We know that when it comes to President Biden, that he's made a series of promises for Black Americans and people who care deeply about racial equality. They talked about they being Democrats primarily, even Republicans on this front talked about getting police reform done. The House did its job. Biden tried to push it. It never even came up in the Senate. It simply failed. Um, and then of course we have voting rights, which is yet to be something that we see. And we also know that there was a recent uh, Supreme Court decision about Alabama and gen gerrymandering. So we are continuously seeing across the board, the way that predominantly black and, and also low income and predominantly Latino districts are being welded together across the country. And then again, not, not to mention with gerrymandering, we know that Rep Republicans and Democrats engage in that. But when it comes to certain states, particularly those in the South, we know that there is a track record there. When it comes to the direct racial side, people, primarily uh, some conservatives, are aiming to claim that this is an affirmative action hire. Now, when people hear affirmative action as a scholar, uh, 
when I hear affirmative action, it's very much in line with the way that I think about historian Ira Katz Nelson talked about it, which the, the way that he framed it is that affirmative action uh, consists of a set of policies and programs that seek to redress discrimination through active measures to ensure equal opportunity. Those active measures is part of what Biden is trying to do. Before a lot of people, when they hear affirmative action, what they actually hear is, oh, this is going to be a tokenized selection. And this selection is underqualified, which when it comes to, so, to the Supreme Court selections that have been uh, noted, at least in the media, we haven't heard uh, much from the Biden administration yet, but the kind of the consensus front runner is Judge uh, Katanja uh, Brown Jackson, who is uh, in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Of course, that is viewed as, as pretty much uh, the elite status right behind SCOTUS um, in terms of that. And, and of course, she was a former uh, Breyer clerk and also a Biden selection for that. I mean, there are others as well that have been noted, such as uh, California Supreme Court Justice Leandra uh, Kruger, and then also uh, Michelle Childs, who is a big one because this person is being promoted out of South Carolina by Representative Clyburn. And we all know what South Carolina has meant to President Biden. It could be argued without South Carolina and particularly uh, black Democrats in South Carolina, he would not be president because during the primaries, uh, he had lost uh, the, the previous two states and then went to South Carolina, won and kept that going. But see, there's a broader framework here that's important. I, I just want to take two more minutes and, and highlight this. When we talk about the Supreme Court pick, again, it's the perception that these people are underqualified. When you can look at look at their track records, and of course, we could have list, listed a laundry list of names of specifically Black women, noting that all of them are highly qualified for this election. But it extends to other parts of the government as well. Take Dr. Lisa Cook, who is up for the Federal Reserve. She has been framed as being, quote, unqualified uh, by some Republicans. When you look at her track record, not only as, a, as a, um, an economics professor, but also her pedigree coming from Harvard, her time in federal government. I mean, the list could go on and on about how qualified she is. And then, of course, with the Super Bowl upcoming, I, I can't help but to mention what is happening in the NFL with Brian Flores. Of course, he filed a discrimination lawsuit alleging that uh, that NFL teams were, were not trying to hire a black person. What led kind of what was the backlash after that? Well, on one hand, you have the Houston Texans, which has one of the worst track records when it comes to race. They hired Lovey Smith, who was a former Chicago Bears coach. And then you also have um, uh, Mike McDaniels, who was selected as the next Dolphins coach. Of course, Brian Flores had that position previously. Uh, McDaniels uh, is framed as being multiracial, and it should be noted that the Rooney Rule in the NFL, which requires NFL teams to at least um, interview one minority candidate, that the team where that coach is coming from actually gets picked. So the 49ers got picks for the McDaniels hire. Now, I want to end this by saying, by, by, by quickly talking about affirmative action more broadly. When it comes to affirmative action, we know that in 1961, President Kennedy used affirmative action to say that we need to ensure that federal contractors across race have an equi equitable opportunity to gain those contracts. Affirmative action has helped Black people and other minorities, but particularly it's been important for increasing gender representation. But we know that it can quickly be reversed, like Proposition 209 in California, which was the affirmative action policy in California for higher education. That was removed in the 90s, and because of that, not only did Blacks and Latinos, not only were they less likely to go to the University of California system, their wages also suffered. Research has documented that by not getting that particular pedigree, uh, their wages suffered. Why would that be the case? Well, a recent study, recent sociological study, showed that um, individuals coming from, say, Ivy League schools compared to state schools, where I, I've traditionally gotten all my degrees, Indiana University and being a professor at University of Maryland, that uh, there is an Ivy League purchase with that, a level of currency. However, that currency does not extend to Black people. In fact, um, whites who attend state schools have a similar likelihood 
of getting called back for jobs at black, as Black people who attend Ivy League schools and Black people who attend state schools like I did, well, they are so far down the totem pole that is clearly inequitable. And the last point I want to make is about what people, how people frame uh, reverse racism, saying that, oh, by Biden saying that this person is going to get this pick, that a Black person is going to get it, it's actually discriminating against others. Well, look, not only do we simply have to look at the Supreme Court or the Senate, but research actually doesn't document that. Research actually says that affirmative action typically only pertains to people who are highly qualified and the actual percentage of white people who would be impacted by affirmative action is so low that it's oftentimes uh, insignificant in statistical models. So I think the bottom line is that uh, this is long overdue, but Biden knows that this is gonna be a large bone politically to try to appease uh, particularly a group of Black Americans who have expected more up to this point. Thanks, Rashawn. There's a lot to unpack there, and I know we're going to get into that um, as we move forward in this discussion, and then certainly in the questions and answers uh, Q&A session, which will follow um, our discussion here. You know, uh, you mentioned voting, and so I want to touch a little bit on voting rights, um, which of course is a perennial uh, civil rights and human rights issue for Black Americans. Um, and I want to do that not only to highlight what's happening clearly both the state and federal levels, but, you know, but to understand what options Black Americans have to continue to advance uh, their own civil rights. So I'm going to do a round robin starting with Nicole. Um, just talk a little bit about voting rights. What is it that we need to be doing to continue this long, uh, decades long slog um, to, uh, you know, show, be able to show up at the voting booth and uh, have our votes taken seriously? Yeah, well, thank you, Camille, and uh, thank you to my colleagues and to all of you who are watching today. Black History Month is not just a month, it's actually every day, and so we should always remember that it is a 365-day affair. Camille, before I actually talk about voting rights, I want to just uh, tag along real quickly with my esteemed colleague who talked a little bit about the history of affirmative action as well as where we are today with the Supreme Court pick. And I think Dr. Ray was somewhat kind as he actually outlined that argument. The bottom line is it's an attack on black women right now. And we have to be really clear that this attack on black women is a residual effect of this polarization that we have experienced in this country. And as Dr. Ray has mentioned, these additive effects, no uh, passage of the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act, the fact that we're still debating whether or not black people in this country should have voting rights, the fact that we still are facing what I work on, a digital divider that is systematically oppressing people of color, that's a problem. And so now we stand as a sociologist, as like uh, Dr. Ray, where we're seeing these code words of quota and are uh, not qualified enough. And that's really disturbing in a society where black women have been a, a central part and spine of the history of this country, dating back to Harriet Tubman and others who actually were responsible for our freedom. But I needed to put that out there, Dr. Ray, because I think you were being a little bit uh, kind on that. There is an attack on black women right now that needs to be addressed. And I think uh, President Biden is going to do the right thing. He did the right thing with uh, Vice President Harris. The bottom line is it's gotta be somewhere that we can get some progress where it's not debatable when it comes to race. With that being the case, I think voting rights is a big problem right now. I think on the one hand, as uh, Rashawn has mentioned, the fact that we actually need to get a SCOTUS of color, woman of color into that position, a black woman into that position, is sort of appeasement on the fact that we don't have voting rights legislation that is in actually in action right now. And that's problematic because as we approach the midterms, it's gonna be very important that we have these rules ironed out and straight. There should not be ambiguity and confusion. And on top of that, if you lay out the fact that we don't have voting rights legislation, we still have misinformation and disinformation that is moving people away from the polls. So I do think that this is a pivotal point and a pivotal moment, particularly as we're seeing redistricting happening right before the Supreme Court, even if we were to place a black woman in that position, she wouldn't have majority. She'd have more dissents that she probably would write versus anything else. But these cases are coming before the Supreme Court in a meaningful way. And I think if anything that we learned from the Shelby case is if, if we don't get this right, we actually deter and regress on the progress that black Americans have made since the Voting Rights Act was initially installed. It's so interesting, and I'll kind of stop here because I know we have a lot of other questions, that we continue to debate what used to be a bipartisan issue. 
Um, and that to me sounds like we're still in the abyss of something that is very unique to society right now that is very much tethered to the political and racial climate that we're in. As Rayshawn said, I was telling my daughter who was 15 the other day, I just can't believe the, the number of times that I could actually code how race is actually constructed and narrated on our, our televisions and in our media and online. And so I think there's something to be said about how we actually look at these sociological implications of the last four to eight years. I mean, look, we just came out of having a president that was black. How did we get here and the extent to which we're actually going to get moving on voting rights in time for us to not have another attack on black people, which is the gubernatorial race of Stacey Abrams? I mean, there's some key pivotal races that are happening right now. If we don't get this right, we're actually going to see the spiral effect of what Dr. Ray talked about, where uh, there's going to be an affront on black people through the course of time. And that's not going to work well for uh, black voters, and it definitely is not going to work well for Democrats, where we've actually had our highest alignment and allegiance. So I'll stop there, uh, and curious to hear what my other colleagues say on this as we do this round robin, but uh, good morning, America. We're here to talk about <laughs> Black history. Thank you, Nicole. Andre, why don't you get your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I, I can't add much on the voting rights issue, except for this has been a long um, there's been a long history of denying citizens, largely because we are not considered citizens. Membership entails this idea that um, membership determines largely um, what kind of uh, rights you receive, what kind of benefits you receive. And when you see these attacks on voting rights, it's really a reflection of we are not considered true, authentic members of this community. No one would enact such ugly, and, and pernicious laws. I mean, the, the voting um, prohibitions in Georgia are just insane. Um, unless you don't think I'm a fully human or in, in, in civic terms, a full citizen. So for me, I'm, I can't add much more than what's been added, but there's been a long standing belief in this country that says black people are not full citizens. And we see that time and time again on the assault of our voting rights and the silence, quite frankly, not only from the Republican Party on this issue, but silence from um, people um, by and large who don't really see this as a serious issue. Um, this is, you know, gets to the very core of a democracy. And so, but for me, it's, um, it's sad to say this, but this is something I grew up knowing, grew up seeing, um, um, grew up understanding that many people don't value me as an American itself. Thank you, Andre. Keon. Well, thank you all for um, inviting me to be here. Thank you, Camille, for, for hosting this. Um, I'll pick up where Nicole um, a co couple of comments that Nicole mentioned in terms of voting rights used to be a bipartisan effort. And I think the, the lack of progress or the retrenchment in voting rights is really a signal and marker of really the fragmentation that's happening across the country in many different ways. And also that this is a very clear indicator of the many ways that people are trying to stall or prevent um, progression, progression in a number of different ways. So when we look at the, the slow rate that many states have expanded um, Medicaid because that was viewed as very political, it was viewed as accepting dollars from the Obama administration, but many of the states that chose to not expand Medicaid or have done it sort of at a slower rate, those are the states with the worst health conditions in many different ways. And so when we think about that fragmentation and we think about the ways that people are trying to live better lives, not only because of um, their health, the kinds of health decisions that people need to make, and part of that is being, having access to health, quality health care, but other issues that relate to um, economics and education become really important in terms of how, what we think about why voting rights is, is a particular important issue and why preventing people um, the right to vote has become important as we also think about other implications or indicators of why voting rights becomes important, as we have seen people being purged from, um, from the roles in a number of different ways, 
I was just watching on the news last night that would take something that's taking place in Florida where there are people who are claiming to represent the Republican national, um, the Republican um, caucus there are systematically going to um, houses of color and re-registering people um, as Republicans. That becomes a very you know, dangerous sort of pathway in terms of thinking about er eroding people's rights and people's access to vote to voting. Not only are we, not only is sort of this a, a indicator of um, fragmentation, but it's also really an indicator of the lack of ways that we have been engaging communities in very important in, in important ways. And so part of that is when we think about the ways that people need to have access to, to voting, we are also using some of these same strategies to disenfranchise um, and preventing them from voting. Thanks very much, Keon. And I'll, I'll just say, you know, I think the retrenchment and uh, the kinds of legislation that we've seen um, passed at the state level in particular is very, very appalling, um, particularly in light of all the work that's been done to try to recognize Black Americans over many, many dec decades. And I agree with all of you to say that that retrenchment really is an indication of the continuing uh, level of discrimination, the continuing um, thoughts that, you know, essentially that we don't matter and we're not full citizens. And it's really important for us for a variety of different reasons, the least of which is that uh, who is voting uh, ends up, um, you know, uh, ends up uh, selecting the people who create the what's the what's possible in public policy. And so when you don't have a uh, lot large numbers of us voting, that also curtails what is that public policy blueprint from which policies are selected and that affect all of us. So I'm going to move on um, and switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, we all know that uh, there has been a very large endemic uh, gap between household wealth and white household, black household wealth and white household wealth in the US. Um, Andre, I want to start this conversation with you and I'm sure others will uh, contribute to it, but what are some of the ways in which this gap has been entrenched and how might we be able to change the sort of longstanding nature of this wealth gap? Well, Camille, I'm, I'm glad we talked about voting rights because one of the primary indicators of how resources and opportunities and rights are denied to um, um, Black people is, is reflected in the wealth gap. Um, according to the latest Federal Reserve numbers, at, at least in 2019, um, a median net worth of white families was about 188,000 compared to 24,000 for Black families, that's about an eight times difference. And, and we see throughout the various asset classes, this disparity show up in terms of um, households with checking accounts. Um, we see 95% uh, of white American or, or families having a checking account compared to 85%. When you're talking about our involvement in the stock market, we see that about 24% of white Americans participate compared to 10% of, of Black Americans. And 401ks, um, those who have it, uh, are, are white Americans, 48% compared to 39%, 10 points difference. And then, and, and I'll just say one more, educational savings accounts um, of 5.5% of white households compared to 1.7% um, of, of, of Black households. You know, and, and so, um, as a measure of the uh, total assets minus all the things you owe, um, wealth is that indicator of, of opportunity extended or not extended um, to Black Americans. But I, it doesn't just show up in material goods. Um, this wealth divide is also reflected in uh, the, the attacks on critical race theory, our knowledge production. Um, yes, and, and we know that the attack on CRT is somewhat of a sham in that you don't see schools uh, per se, most schools don't teach critical race theory, a set of uh, theories that are largely taught in graduate school. However, this did give cover for the Republican party to again, attack black cultural production, books, 1619 project in particular. Um, but there's always been an effort 
to, um, to, to delegate what is true American history or not, but it's also obviously a, this uh, attack on CRT, a, a, a tool to rally the Republican base as well. Um, but I, I say all that um, to say that if we're going to rectify it, there's n at some point, you either have to eliminate some of the debt that is incurred because of racism um, or provide assets. And there's no way around that. And so when people talk about, um, uh, you know, should we have race-based policies? Well, we got here because of race-based policy. And if we're ever going to improve home ownership rates, um, participation in stock market, and other, and other uh, uh, participation in, in, in various assets, we're going to have to be targeted in delivering those. And likewise, I'm, and I'm, this is something I'm very passionate about. Um, there's a big conversation internally at Brookings about canceling student debt. And this is where I, I've, I've always felt. The ultimate solution is to have some form of free college at the two-year and four-year level, particularly for public institutions. Um, when, but for a significant period of time, when higher ed was largely white, it was mostly subsidized. It really looked close to um, what we see at the K-12 in education, or people could very well afford it, or it was subsidized. As soon as Black people, brown people, started going to college at higher rates, which we are, we started to depend on a more loan finance um, system of, uh, of, of higher education. And we are then penalized as a result for not being able to own homes, not being able to pass on assets to our family. So we have to take out loans and then we are penalized. So for me, when people spout that, that uh, student debt cancellation is regressive, it is to bury their heads in the sand to the historic systemic discrimination that black people face and to continuously center white people as the, the reason why or why not we should receive or, or should enact policy. So for me, yes, you know, uh, we need to figure out ways to restore um, the value of assets that's been extracted from racism. We need to remove the drags of racism that prevent us from collecting assets. But for me, the, which is as important, we have got to stop burying our heads in the sand to the reason why we have the wealth divides today. It's not because black people aren't pulling up their pants, not saving well, not knowing how to marry, marry properly. It's because black people were denied assets. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Andre. Um, so I just want to check in with the audience and let you know that we are looking forward to a very vibrant Q&A. Um, you can submit a question, so you can do so via Twitter at BrookingsGov um, with, uh, with uh, hashtag Black History Month, or you can do so via email at events at brookings.edu. So Twitter, so Twitter is at BrookingsGov with the hashtag Black History Month or email at events at brookings.edu. Hey, Camille, so, oh, yeah. Camille can, okay. can I respond to something to Andre, which I think is pertinent, and it goes back to Rashawn's comment about the NFL. So as Andre was speaking, I was actually thinking about how these systems of stratification actually show up, and at the core of it is asset building, as Andre has, you know, really worked profoundly on to actually show us what these equity divides are. When you think about the NFL and the situation that they're going through today, as uh, Rashawn had talked about, it goes deeper than the representation of how many coaches are Black. It actually goes to the systems of stratification that are actually embedded in the NFL system. The players, which are everyday people, if you were to equate them with the folks that Andre is talking about, have money, but they don't have potentially the wealth, the ownership, the equity, the stakes that allowed them to actually define their own destiny. Carter G. Woodson, a famous sociologist, said, if you don't control your thinking, somebody else will do it for you. 
But I think that the root of it, and it's so important to actually address, and Andre, I just love the way that you actually express that, this equity uh, debate has to be at the center when it comes to equitable wealth, because these systems of stratification actually show up in all aspects of our lives. It's no secret that there are no owners <laughs> in the NFL of color or who are Black, but there are players. And it's no secret in society that, as Andre said, and Rashawn and Keon could probably attest to, that we have not seen declining Black um, engagement in the labor force, nor have we seen a decline in the number of Black men and women who have been actively educated or credentialed. But what we have not seen is this growth uh, due to the stagnation that Dr. Perry talked about of wealth acquisition. And for sociologists, I think for people who are listening today, that is a pivotal distinction to make between, and this kind of goes back to the, the conversation about voting rights, Supreme Court pick uh, and everything else. When you do not have asset access to assets, it's very hard for you to have uh, access to decisions. And that also aligns with the inability to have rights like voting, which in many respects is an asset that engages you in the democratic process. So I think, Andre, I was, I was thinking about you, I see a blog in there because there's something to be said around ownership, which in many verticals of society, we're not seeing equitable ownership, which in many respects also translates into closing the wealth gap. Thank you, Nicole. No, and there's Go ahead, no, Andre. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, you got me started, Nicole. And I, because I always remind people when in conversations about business ownership or any home ownership, it means much more to a Black American than other, others in this country. We were once the assets that were mortgaged, traded, um, used to build other people's wealth. And for me, it is a personal issue that when people talk about, oh, we shouldn't talk about reparations, or we shouldn't talk about um, affirmative action of the like, We've had centuries of affirmative action for, for, for white people. We've had centuries of reparations for white people. But yet when we have these discussions about black people become, oh no, I didn't own any slaves. I don't know how to pay for that. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. And so for me, we've got to get past this intellectual barrier um, that, um, Th that somehow removes this history, this deep history from this current state of affairs. We lack ownership because we were once owned and there's a lot of people who want to maintain that power. Wealth is important and it's a, a, a central indicator, but it's about power more so than anything. Thanks, Andre. Rishan, I'm, I'm sure you have a couple of words to add to this, so, um, you know, feel free to, to contribute. Yeah, I mean, most definitely. I mean, this, this is an important conversation. I, I think the big thing that Andre and Nicole are highlighting is that we are currently in a critical thinking crisis. And part of it is linked to education. The other part is linked to how we consume media in small sound bites and how cognitively we are, we are getting programmed and have been to receive information, to not necessarily think about it. And when it comes to thinking about critical race theory, I think that's one of them. You know, last year um, it was defund the police. This year is, is critical race theory. And, and look, no, no one can ever say that, that in this case, in this time period, that Republicans are not great at creating these sound bites, creating more or less these smoke screens and actually having a way of framing an issue that is not about the issue at all. And when we talk about critical race theory, for example, critical race theory, and Andre, Andre noted this, I mean, overall, this is a, um, a legal doctrine, it's a theory that a framework by which we understand society. And part of what it simply says is that our social institutions are laced with racism that's embedded in our policies, our rules, our laws, and regulations. And those are simply empirical facts. Accordingly, what has happened though, and Alexandra Gibbons and I did an analysis um, at Brookings showing that across the country, when we look at legislation related to critical race theory or supposedly about critical race theory, and we keep updating this every month because they're just coming out of the wazoo, 
But what we found was that overwhelmingly they weren't about critical race theory at all. Now, of late, some of them are starting to mention the 1619 Project, which I should also note on this critical thinking uh, front is important because I was having a, a discussion um, on a on a media platform with a um, with, with a, a politician in Texas who I made a statement. I said, "Well, look, of the 1619 Project, some some of the scholars who wrote for that, I, I know them actually personally. I said they are some of the top scholars we have in the world. They, their pedigree and where they're currently professors there, from Harvard to Princeton, are endless." And she said, that's not true. And I was like, that's, no, that, that's just like their names are listed and where they work at. And so, so, so I say that to say, if that's what we're arguing about, <laughs> think about how far we have to go. Like th this is their place of employment. This is where they are actually employed at. Accordingly, the other part about the critical race theory um, legislation is not only do, do many of them not mention critical race theory, then the question becomes, what do they mention? Well, what they are doing is they are framing any discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion as being something that should not occur. And as Andre noted, um, overwhelmingly in schools, this isn't occurring. And I'll even tell you at the university level, at the undergraduate level, this isn't occurring, but I'll tell you what is happening. Because of this critical race theory, uh, broader framework that's got out um, into the public sphere, students come to me at the University of Maryland and say, can we have a discussion about critical race theory? I'm trying to make sense of it. And I'm thinking, well, if you take my graduate course, that's something that we'll talk about. But now I am having discussions about it at the undergraduate level. And I've talked to some high school teachers who are doing the same thing. So we have to be clear about what it's actually doing. Two more quick points, one related to reparations. I wanna uh, fill in some of the things that, that our colleagues were saying, because it's so, so important to stress this point. Oftentimes when we talk about reparations, we're talking about enslavement. That's important to do. Why? Because in 1860, as Andre and I wrote in our piece on reparations, in 1860, the physical bodies of Black people was worth $3 billion. Just the physical body. That was worth more than the railroads and the factories. We haven't even got to the products they produced. We haven't even got to the way that their bodies were leased to purchase land, to get, uh, to get loans from banks. That is the asset that Andre is describing. But um, when Andre and Nicole noted that affirmative action was under a different guise in the past, Ira Katz Nelson, who I mentioned earlier, historian, wrote a classic book, an instant classic that everyone should read called When Affirmative Action Was White. And yes, he talked about enslavement, but he also talked about what was happening during the New Deal. Quickly to mention this, what happened during the New Deal is you had eight out of 10 men born during the 1920s get drafted and go to war, white and black and otherwise. So that means in the 1950s and 60s, they were in their 30s and 40s. This is just putting this in context. It's not that long ago. When they came back from war, part of the GI Bill, veterans received a series of benefits, down payment assistance for homes, which were in the form of grants, small business grants, for these small businesses that, that happens in middle America and downtowns across the country, and also uh, tuition grants and money to send their children to college. Well, see, that money was mandated federally and distributed locally. So black, black veterans who were serving beside their, their white counterparts in the war, when they came back, they did not receive that money. And that's the reason why we have such a surplus of historically black colleges and universities to this day. And on that front, we have to note that HBCUs are beacons of hope and success that we have to stress and highlight because they were not structured to survive. And yet and still here we are decades later, they are still thriving. Why is that? Because they actually fill a gap. And also because that's what black people have always done. It's been resilient in the face of adversity. So when it comes to reparations, the point on that, on that topic, Andre talked about the broader wealth gap. Education does little to close that gap. Like college educated black people have about seven times less wealth than college educated white people. Education does little to actually address that. And then when it comes to student loans, I mentioned HBCUs, a study documented that students who attended HBCUs actually were more likely to receive subprime education loans. Like this is baked into our society in banking, in housing, in education. And then we haven't even got to talking about the criminal justice system and policing yet. The whole point is that as we think about celebrating Black History Month, it's important to note that these inequities exist, but the way that Black people have been resilient to persevere 
is something that is part of the legacy. And I'll tell you, part of this critical thinking crisis that we are in is because there are some people in this country who are more likely to be conservative based on what we know statistically, do not want the current generation to learn the truth because if they do, it's gonna change the way they vote, it's gonna change the, change the way they behave, and it's gonna change the way they view their own legacy. And there's some people in America who actually don't want that to happen. Thank you, Rayshawn. We're gonna shift gears a little bit because uh, there is a topic we, we haven't discussed, which is um, incredibly important and um, of you know, very current urgency. So although we uh, never would have imagined um, that we would still be in the midst of a global pandemic in 2022, we are. The two-year experience with coronavirus has unmasked some of the, what we know to be glaring inequities, both in opportunity and in the public health infrastructure, and even in the assumptions under which public health advisories and public health is conducted. So Keon, I want you to kind of take us through what we've learned about public health opportunities, uh, what that has meant for black communities, what we've learned in general about the way the public health infrastructure has approached the health of blacks and the health of communities of color. Thank you for that question. Um, as you've already mentioned, you know, COVID-19 has unmasked, unearthed, unveiled, many of the existing challenges that my colleagues have already talked about. And really the problem and challenge has been our inability to link these social and structural determinants to health outcomes, whether that's health behaviors, whether that's um, systems and structures that are, are there to support health and to um, help us be very healthy and um, all those kinds of things. They really go down to sort of really very basic things that we need to be healthy on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's not only access to healthcare, but access to healthy food sources, housing, high quality neighborhoods, um, that even, you know, being, you know, neighborhoods that have, you know, that are safe, that are walkable. You know, when we talk about, you know, making changes to health, a lot of people tend to focus on those day-to-day -day behaviors. But what we really understood or, not understood well so, so far is how the structures and these systems operate in a way to prevent people from making those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think as we continue through this pandemic, we've seen incredible inequities, incredible gaps in the ways that some people have been able to protect themselves and to prevent um, contracting COVID-19. When we look at data that suggests that people who live in suburban neighborhoods or live in neighborhoods where they were able to social distance not only within their houses but within their neighborhoods. Those people tend to be tended to be healthier. When we look at those who had economic resources, in particular savings, when those folks lost their jobs, their high-paying jobs or jobs in certain industries, they were able to tap into their savings as a way of being able to survive and mitigate through the pandemic. When we talk about sort of the the larger sort of scheme of, of the, the public health infrastructure looks like, we've learned that we've not been able to adequately monitor and track this disease because we weren't adequately in monitoring and tracking other diseases. Our public health systems were, um, were inept and inadequate in many different ways. And so we have actually had to rely on private entities and, and on universities to do a much better job of tracking these um, than what the federal government was able to do. And so we also know that there's considerable underreporting even when it comes to that. Um, also, when we think about sort of what the public health infrastructure looks like, it, it has actually sort of undermined itself with its inability to, to control and to manage and to think about prevention strategies for COVID-19. Um, the CDC is gonna have an incredible challenge over the next few years of repairing a lot of the damage that it's done in terms of its um, reporting, its framing of the disease, the ways that it has um, articulated prevention strategies. Um, week to week, we have, you know, changes and it confuses people. Um, there is a, a lack of coordination across government entities and agencies in terms of the ways that they communicate and talk about not only, only COVID-19 itself, but the various ways of preventing it. Um, early during the pandemic, the federal government was, was really sort of um, terrible, and for lack of a better way of saying it, 
and being able to coordinate efforts. And it really caused another, another level or another layer of fragmentation in terms of the resources that are deployed to states, the ways that states then deployed resources to local and county public health departments. And as a result of that, many, many local and county public health departments were left to their own devices to figure out how they were going to manage the pandemic. And that also sort of seeded other levels and other, other ways that people distrust or mistrust public health largely, but, but county and local public health departments and, and officials. And so as we sort of continue to think about what, what the implications of that are, that certainly means that there is going to be a deepening of health disparities. Not only have we seen disparities as it relates to infections of COVID-19, but also because of COVID-19 sort of taking presence in, in many communities, we're also gonna see a deepening of chronic diseases. And so we're gonna see a rise in many of the risk factors that contributed to the ways that people contracted COVID-19. When you look at data and, and you look at um, comorbidities of COVID-19 mortality, um, influenza, asthma, hypertension, diabetes were some of the, the leading um, chronic disease comorbidities. We already know that those, those issues and challenges exist within black communities and in, in low income communities already. And we know that many people delayed seeking healthcare because they couldn't access healthcare. Um, people, many people didn't have access to telehealth opportunities to you know, stay in touch with their physicians or other primary care providers. So we're gonna see a delay in diagnosis or the onset of some of those diseases. We've already started to see that in, in some cancers like colorectal cancer um, as a result of the pandemic. And also what we've seen is sort of a, a reduction in life expectancy as a result of, the, of, of COVID-19 as well. Life expectancy was already starting to take a very, very small dip um, starting in 2020. And we'll continue to probably see some of that decline um, over the next couple of years as a result of COVID-19. Also, when we think about comorbidities and the delays that, people, that, we've, that we've seen in a number of different ways. And so as we think about sort of what needs to happen in the public health infrastructure, we need better monitoring systems to be able to address, to track and, and monitor disease. We need better opportunities for engaging communities in ways that, that's meaningful to them and sort of really reaches people on a day-to-day -day basis of thinking about how do we engage them in prevention efforts to ensure that they're healthy. We also really need to think about how are we really gonna use this moment as we've um, discussed many of the inequities to really sort of repair not only the public health infrastructure itself, but many of the factors that contribute to what, what means, what, what allows you to be healthy. And so part of that is, is certainly thinking about how do we improve our social and our physical environments as ways and opportunities to improve health. So we have uh, lots of people that still live in um, low quality housing that contributes to um, uh, respiratory diseases. We have many people that still are unable to access healthcare as a result of policy changes that have not occurred. Um, and we also have um, in opportunities in many different ways of sort of the ways that we engage communities to talk to them or engage them in the solutions that are important in terms of improving public health. So when I think about sort of the public health infrastructure, those are the things I think that are really important moving forward. Right. I appreciate that, Keon. And um, I just a follow up question. So, you know, it seems to me that um, certainly the level of COVID-19 deaths among the Black community were preventable. Many of them were very preventable, but we just didn't have the infrastructure. We didn't have the outreach uh, to be able um, to make sure that people, you know, did not get COVID and were thriving and had the right information, et cetera. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting when you think about the public health infrastructure is that it does in many ways um, depend upon, or in some ways, um, in, in some ways it, it has, uh, operates with a lot of the sim similar assumptions to the medical profession. And um, we know that the medical profession has had a very, very hard time um, disengaging from racism and racist assumptions. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. That was back to me. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so it's, it's really interesting when we think about what racism has done and sort of, um, or the ways that we've been able to frame racism in, pu in public health sort of largely and sort of when we think about 
the representation even of um, black physicians, black public health workers, all of those things sort of taken together. And so, um, you know, in 2020, many places just declared racism as a public health crisis, as a public health challenge, but they actually really didn't know what that meant. They just knew sort of that racism was out there, people have linked it to, to health in some kind of way, but there was really sort of no very clear strategy of what to do or how to respond to that. So many people sort of started thinking about, well, well, what are the ways that we can try to understand this? And so in some of the work that I've done with some of my colleagues at St. Louis University, um, we actually sort of studied the ways that racial equity tools can be used to actually address racism in, in public health or actually changing policies and laws to, um, to um, in, increase um, health, um, health equity in a number of different ways. When we think about sort of the link, sort of framing of public health as it as it relates to sort of the medical profession, um, that's been a, a, a very sort of clear challenge. I link sort of them all within sort of the public health infrastructure largely because our goals really are to try to prevent people from becoming sick. Unfortunately, we really sort of rely on people being sick to then figure out how do we respond to that. And that's really sort of the inappropriate strategy or the in inappropriate mechanisms in terms of how do we prevent people from being healthy. We're much more interested in sick care than we are in prevention, um, prevention efforts. And that becomes a real challenge. And unfortunately, our medical professionals are not very well trained in terms of thinking about health at a population level, which public health tries to do. And so they're really sort of focused on sort of individual changes. That's, that's important, but we really sort of have to think about what happens at community levels, what happens when that patient goes home to a neighborhood that's, um, that's crime ridden um, or a neighborhood that's unsafe, neighborhoods that don't have you know, street lights, neighborhoods that don't have sidewalks, neighborhoods that don't have um, full service grocery stores, neighborhoods that um, when young people are afraid to go to, uh, go to school because of fear of, of violence, or even young people that when they have to go to white neighborhoods, they fear being discriminated against. And so when we think about sort of what public health means in, a, in sort of a larger scheme and sort of the various disciplines that fall under that, that becomes very important in terms of how do, we, how do we frame our population level approaches to health? And how do we include all these various actors and stakeholders? And so also part of that means that we need to think, we need to start having conversations with business owners as well in, ter in terms of thinking about what's their role in contributing to, to public health. So as people even sort of think about, well, how do they make changes to ensure that their workforce is healthy? That becomes a public health question in a number of different ways. And also sort of that becomes, part they become engaged in the conversations about how do we improve not only to access to high quality healthcare, but also how do we change healthcare systems so that they are equitable and also sort of the ways that we sort of reach people in, 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 in their communities. So sort of when we take all of that together, we really have to realize and recognize what are, the, what are our individual roles in improving um, the, the health of well-being of Black Americans, but also sort of what's the totality of that of us all working together and making sure that there are policies that exist that, in, that ensure that people can have equal access not only to healthcare, but making healthy, healthy decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Keon, for that. Nicole, I know you wanted to add something, um, you know, rel relative to the public health infrastructure. Yeah, thank you, Camille and Keon. I, I love the way you just outlined that because I think what you've actually talked about is some of the crisis that we've been in this country, particularly with the public health infrastructure. I just wanted to tag on to what you said, though, and this is work that um, I'm doing with colleagues at Brookings. We're actually coming out with a paper on this, which is the role of telehealth in the public health infrastructure system as well, right? Because what that did over the course of the pandemic, we saw a 100% increase in telehealth use or any type of remote interaction with your doctor, and particularly among Black Americans, right? Those who had not had adequate access to medical institutions or providers were able to hop on their smartphone or some other internet-enabled device to actually get online. Now, there are digital equity problems that I'll talk about later, but in particular, asynchronous um, interaction where you weren't necessarily live with your doctor, and in some cases, when you didn't turn on your video, it allowed you to get some care. Um, I just wanted to put that out there because, Keon, to your point, I think we need to start adding that into the equation because what we also saw with the government over COVID is that you couldn't schedule your vaccination or get your test kit or actually update your records without internet access. 
So if we're going to make internet access part of the public health infrastructure overall, it's important that we also sort of blend care equity, health equity, and digital equity so that people can get online to transact in those matters. So I wanted to put that out there because oftentimes we're sort of seen as uh, telehealth is ancillary to the public health infrastructure, but really what my colleagues and I are doing at the Center for Technology Innovation is starting to think through how do you actually make telehealth something that's more permanent post the pandemic because it can actually squeeze into those crevices where we've not been able to address, you know, sufficiently health equity concerns. Great. Can Thanks, I, Nicole. Yeah, I, go ahead. Tag, tag on one other thing. Uh, you know, we must separate the connection between healthcare and employment. You know, um, one of the long-standing legacies of slavery is that in many business models, um, they they extract as much from labor as possible without providing benefits. One of the reasons why we have a, um, a higher incidence of death is because we work in jobs that don't provide proper health care. We and, and in addition, we are overrepresented in essential frontline work that puts us at greater risk. We are also represented. And, and higher rates in intergenerational housing, as Kian mentioned. And so for me, if we talk about advancements in public health, we really do need to make healthcare public. Um, we need a public option, a single payer system, because as long as there are people who will take advantage of this growth model that extracts wealth from people, we will be in this situation because over time, people have shown that they don't care about Black people's voting rights, our health, how, where, where we work, how hard we work, or how we die. And so for me, at some point, we have got to have a move forward ACA to a, a single payer system that separates um, um, health care by employment. Great, thanks, Andre. Kian, I know there are several things you wanted to respond to, so please go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll try to make it very quick. Um, Andre, you mentioned something about single payer, and I'm gonna link this to Camille's earlier question to me about you know, things we've learned about COVID-19. COVID-19 actually taught us that we have elements or we can implement elements of a single payer system. The idea that we can, you know, get the government to pay for testing, imagine that, that we can get the government to pay for vaccines, imagine that, and then sort of figure out ways that we can distribute them to states, um, seems like elements of a single payer system. Unfortunately though, you know, earlier in the pandemic, you know, states had to compete, you know, for PPE, states had to, had to compete for, you know, testing supplies, but the government started to actually try to work some of that out and being able to negotiate that as sort of time, you know, time went. The challenge that we, that we remain are there are significant barriers, you know, from state to state, um, but, in, but not only government involvement or government intervention, but even sort of business interventions really started to think about, well, how can we actually work together to make sure that people are somewhat safe at some level? So I actually think that that's a very important thing that we need to sort of point to and to talk about a little bit more in terms of being able to push various mechanisms and pathways to thinking about what does single payer look like? And I think there's some very important lessons learned from COVID-19 and that help maybe sort of point us in that direction moving forward. Thanks, Keon. Um, I wanna move to uh, a topic which um, I think is so in incredibly important for uh, black communities and that is, about the digital divide. And I know that um, Dr. Turner Lee has been working on this topic for a long time and has been a you know, leading voice uh, nationally on this topic. But certainly COVID-19 pointed out all the ways in which we have many, many disconnected communities. So Nicole, I wanted to uh, ask you about that. And you know, what have we learned about the digital divide in the US? And what options do we have to eliminate that and bring everyone to the, in the U.S. to parity? 
Yeah. Well, Camille, I, I promise I'm not going to sound like a Black Baptist preacher because that's what I am when you actually talk as you talk about the digital divide. Uh, it's an area that I've, I've been doing for 30 years, pretty much working in the communities as a digital evangelist all the way to here at Brookings. And I have a book coming out. So shameless plug. It is finally coming out, y'all. I'm just telling you right now. Um, it's taking some time, but it is digitally invisible how the internet is creating the new underclass that you should be able to get at Brookings Press in the fall. So this is a really complicated issue, but it's one that I think that I've really come to grips with in my book, which is related to this conversation that we're having right now. The digital divide is actually symptomatic of poverty. It's symptomatic of racism. It's symptomatic of geographic isolation. Before the pandemic, we had millions of people that were actually not connected to the internet. And the majority of those people who I call digitally invisible look like the people we're talking about today, added to being Latina and elderly and disabled um, and very poor in rural and urban areas. And what we have now seen in the pandemic is not only were we right that the digital divide existed when my dear friend Larry Irvin came out with the term while he was at the uh, Department of Commerce, but that it actually affects the economic compasses and the social compass for where people actually land up, particularly black and brown kids. And I think that's a very glaring revelation that yes, we all need to be connected to the internet, but as we see the death of analog, where the things that we used to do in person no longer become valid, like banking, like being able to talk to our doctors, like being able to learn in the uh, elementary or a secondary school system in higher education, the fact that we have people digitally disconnected and digitally invis invisible is, is telling. And I'll give you a great example of this. I mean, I always go back to the schools because I'm a parent myself. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, 50 million kids were actually shown to not have access to the internet. And that was across the board from the 195,000 school districts across this country. Out of that, we found from my friends at Common Sense Media that 15 to 16 million of those kids didn't have either home broadband or a device. Then we found out 9 million didn't have either. Then we later found out that the majority of those 9 million more kids that came from black and brown populations in very poor urban and rural areas. And we soon found out later that some of those kids had to teach themselves because as Andre said, their parents had to go to work. And so when you put all of that together and we look at what we're experiencing now, which are the predicted learning losses of black and Latina students. I just read a study the other day, third grade students are gonna be way behind, six months behind when it comes to math competencies compared to three months of their white counterparts. To me, it sounds very similar to the conversation that we're having today. That we're not talking about bits and bytes and only technological hardware that we can actually see and touch, but we're talking about the quality of lives that people actually live. As Keon and others have said, where people live also matters. If you live in public housing in this country, 1.2 million units of public housing, uh, less than a quarter of them have access to broadband. And if people congregate in those areas and their quality of life depends on their housing, the fact that they were not connected during the pandemic suggests that we left a whole lot more people behind. So I just share that because I think in the end, we actually have to capture the digital divide as a civil rights and problem associated with racial outcomes and equity. If we don't do that, we're gonna continue to make this a conversation about companies and yeah, they got their problems. Don't get me wrong. I got a piece coming out on uh, equity, racial equity and antitrust and racial equity on platforms. But what we're dealing with now is this fundamental right. I, I love the way that my colleagues have said it. There are too many people whose bodies and minds and lands have been leased for the purpose of their generation of work to the society. And now we see a technology where we're actually going in the same route because we think and I'll close here that by giving people a device or broadband service, it's going to change the trajectory. They'll be able to get online and do the things that everybody else can do. But if they don't own the companies that they're actually using for those applications, or they're not engaged in producing in their own community startups that can employ other people of color, Black people in particular, then we actually have created another gateway. As Carter G. Woodson said, that door in the back that we've trained people to go through versus giving them a door in the front. And so I think this is a really important issue that we have to continue to talk about. My colleagues, all of you know that I'm not going to stop talking about it. I'm going to talk about it anytime you ask me to. But I think it's important that we correlate this conversation with the systems of oppression and stratification that exist. I'll just say one more thing, uh, Camille, for people who don't know, I also run Brookings algorithmic bias and discrimination work. 
And if we think that we're in the beginning of a digital divide, the digital future is even worse because it allows us with even greater precision to actually impart the type of discrimination and surveillance that lends itself to these types of inequities that we're talking about today, like knowing what your social media profile says about you to deny you alone, or knowing where you sit in your classroom to suggest that you're not a great learner. These are realities of technology. And I, I commonly tell folks in my work, yes, we need to actually employ the same type of critical thinking. I love that that's come out of this panel in digital spaces. And we need more people who are listening to actually take these issues on so that we move beyond just the simple uh, conversations, I believe, around you know where we're going to deploy infrastructure and how much fiber we're going to use. We need to be talking about how are we using the technology to solve these types of problems? And until we get to that space, I think as we've talked about in every vertical, technology has become a change agent, but it can become more repressive if not actually positioned and structured and defined in a way that it helps us with healthier outcomes. So I'll stop there because I know we got questions. You all know me, I'm an evangelist for this side. I can keep on talking, but for people who want to know more, just get my book. I just asked, just get my book. It's coming out. I want to be like Andre when I grow up. <laughs> so it's coming well, out soon. <laughs> thanks, Nicole. I knew we, we you know, uh, AI had better watch out because uh, they're going to have to tangle. AI is going to have to tangle with Dr. Turner Lee. So um, uh, I think this is a good point to kind of move back into some of the conversations that were so relevant over the last year. Um, we've talked a lot about voting rights. Uh, we've talked a lot about COVID. Um, uh, I do want to make sure that we have an opportunity to get a bit of an update uh, on what is happening in police reform. And the reason I ask that is that we continue to see and you know, uh, black communities continue to experience uh, police terrorism. And um, I think it's really, really important for us to understand what the options are, where we are, what has gone well, hasn't gone well in that realm. And Rishan, I hope you can take us through that. Yeah, so we, we know that over the past couple of years, one, one big flashpoint was obviously the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And if people don't know how far we have not come in that city and around the country, all we have to do is look over the past week, just a few days ago, when Amir Locke was asleep on a couch, police get a key, sneak into the apartment, and shoot him up. And so as we think about that context, and it's important to note, as Ben Crump always says, he had a legally owned firearm. See, just let me make, make this slight pivot, because it's so important with how the media covers stories related to Black people. All they've been showing is the video and then zooming in on the gun. Last time I checked, the Second Amendment says that people have a right to bear arms, particularly in their home when someone sneaks in with guns and starts yelling at you. His firearm was legally owned. You know what's going to happen in Minneapolis again? There's going to be a large civil settlement that's going to speak to the broader context of this particular question. And it's a couple of stats that I really want people to take home as I, as I pivot to talking about local legislation and what's happening at the state level. I say this all the time, black people are 3.5 times more likely than whites to be killed by police when they're not attacking and do not have a weapon. And even if those things are not the case, they're still three times more likely. What that means is when black people and white people behave exactly the same, black people are more likely to be killed and in fact, when they aren't attacking and don't have a weapon, Black people are even more likely to be killed. That is called racism. That's what it is. What we know at the federal level is that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which came um, on the heels of the murder of George Floyd, there was a lot of momentum. Democrats leveraged that momentum. Republicans also leveraged that momentum, really playing up defund the police narratives and framing that in a way that that is not. Defund the police is simply about reallocating funding. Um, abolishing the police is something else, but even there's a very small percentage, including a very small percentage of Black people who actually want that to happen in, in, its, in its kind of natural form. Oftentimes what people want is something to be rebuilt. Accordingly, this leveraging happened and the House of Representatives, Democrats in particular, did what they were supposed to do. They passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act twice. They passed it two times. Um, Congresswoman Karen Bass and Senator Cory Booker were really forging with this. Supposedly they were working with Senator Tim Scott on the Republican side. And all of a sudden that just 
went, went out the wazoo and now Congresswoman Bass is running for mayor of LA. Accordingly, when we think about what's happening on a local level, I have a couple of projects. One is taking a deep dive with some colleagues at University of North Carolina, um, Andy Andrews and Neil Karen, where we're looking at the impact that Black Lives Matter protests had on uh, police reform legislation in cities that are 250,000 uh, people or more. So that uh, roughly about 90 cities. And then I have a project here at Brookings that's looking at what's happening at the state level. What we know is we know what isn't working. I think when it comes to what's, what is working, there are some states that took the legislation in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which mind you, overwhelmingly, Democrats and Republicans agreed on. Things like banning no-knock warrants. Well, you know what? That would have saved Amir Locke's life. But it doesn't matter a whole lot in a city like Minneapolis where they say they banned them. And you know what? The judge that presided over the, over the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd is the same judge that gave the no-knock warrant to go into the home where Mirlock was shot up. See, that is the combination here. And in the words of Ida B. Wells, those who commit the murders write the reports. We see these links together. When we think about what's happening at the state level, I always say, there's a lot bad here. What's good? Well, there are some states that are forging ahead. Maryland, Colorado, New Mexico, Connecticut, not only has uh, the state of Maryland repealed the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, which was a package of, 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 of kind of processes and, and legal doctrine that allowed for police officers to essentially be above the law, where particularly if they commit crimes when they are off duty, oftentimes they don't face a uh, penalty on their jobs for those particular actions. So the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights is a big deal to get rid of. Maryland was the first state to institute it in the 70s. Uh, I hope that other states follow suit. When it comes to qualified immunity, which supposedly was the big flashpoint and the point of, of, of dissent uh, in the Senate, is that states like Colorado, New Mexico, and Connecticut, and then the city of New York has, has moved forward with repealing uh, qualified immunity. Qualified immunity allows for police officers and other government officials to not face any civil culpability, meaning they don't have to pay for financial settlements. Why is that a big deal? That's a big deal because if we look, just say over the past five years, a five-year period, 2015 to 2019, roughly $2 billion with a B, $2 billion of taxpayer money was paid out nationally in civilian settlements for police misconduct. And as much as we focus on the New Yorks and the Chicago's and Minneapolis, Minneapolis's of the United States, these settlements were more likely to happen in small areas with, with, with populations of 50,000 or fewer. And those areas did not have the money to pay. And what happened, there are places like in Inkster, Michigan, places in East Tennessee, where they have lost uh, school systems, where they have uh, had their taxes raised, like in Nebraska. So what's happening at the local level, there are some state legislatures that are saying, we need to move forward with this. Maryland is one, the, the, Maryland, Police Accountability, the Maryland Police Accountability Act should be a blueprint for the nation. Um, I testified on that legislation, even in Virginia, um, where they banned no-knock warrants um, after what happened with Breonna Taylor in Kentucky. Um, Virginia has moved the needle a lot. I think a lot of people are worried under the new governor, Glenn Youngkin, if some of those things will continue or even roll back. For example, under, under the former governor, of course, we talk about the blackface and the KKK role. But since that time, there were a series of, 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 of progress made on the front of policing. And in the state of Virginia, they actually created a diversity, equity, and inclusion commission and kind of a state agency. Governor Yunkin has already reframed that to remove a focus on race and equality and frame it around social class. Look, we should focus on social class, particularly in a state like Virginia. But acting as if race and class are the same thing is a fallacy, although they are highly linked. The last point I'll make is what's happening locally in cities. And I think that Nicole and as well as Keon made this point related to technology and health is that we are seeing huge divides between people living in urban areas and people living in rural areas. Policing is one of those. Where we are seeing progress in cities like Atlanta, which makes sense 
in a lot of regards um, and, and in other cities around the country. But at the state level, we are not seeing that same level of progress. So what that will mean for people, particularly for black people who are disproportionately likely to be killed by police or have use of force uh, put upon them, is when they're in the city, there'll be certain um, certain laws and policies in place. But the minute they go to the county, like in St. Louis, going from St. Louis City to the county, will all of a sudden change and increase their likelihood. And I think these are some of the things to be looking forward. I'm very curious about the factors that explain the differences in states and cities that are moving forward on police reform and those that aren't. So stay tuned. I'm sure I'll have a lot of answers about that. Thanks very much, Rayshawn, for that, that update. Um, and your, your perspectives. Uh, we are in the Q&A period now, so we've gotten a lot of really interesting questions. Um, I wanna start, Andre, with um, a discussion about black assets and how we value black assets. You have made a really um, strong and moving uh, sort of point for um, moving from being seen as an asset to figuring out how we value all the assets and everything, all our contributions um, that we have brought to this country. So I want you to talk a little bit about your work in this area. Yeah, first and foremost, I wanna um, acknowledge my colleagues here. And, and I always have to remind myself and others that people are the most important asset that you can have. And when you hear the elocution, the policy initiatives, the impact of my colleagues, you see what adding black voices can do to an institution. And, and so I, I just wanna uplift my colleagues here and there's um, several who are not with us um, on, on this panel, but they're doing incredible work. And, I, and, and this is not a slight to my employer, I just wanna be clear about that. But many of these issues would not be tackled without the, the, this representation. I just wanna be clear about that. And when I came in, one of the things I wanted to do is add value to my, my program, Metro. And I started looking at black cities and the assets in them. And one of the most important assets um, are, are homes and um, is, is a home. And so um, we started looking at those assets. My colleague, Jonathan Rothwell of Gallup, my then um, RA, research assistant, David Harshbarger, we compared homes in black neighborhoods to, to um, where the share of the black population was 50% or higher. And we compared them to areas where the uh, share of the black population is less than a percent. And we control for education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics. And what we found is that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home. Cumulatively, there's about 156 billion in lost equity. And we know that that lost equity, that 156 would have paid for more than 4 million black owned businesses based upon the average amount of a, that black people used to start their firms. It would have paid for more than 8 million four year degrees based upon the average amount of a four year public education covered um, all of Hurricane Katrina damage, replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3000 times over. And I, and I always bring that up because when things go wrong in, in black communities, we blame black people. And this is why I always say all the time that there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. That, that issue of housing, that devaluation of housing is a metaphor for uh, technology and technological assets. It's a metaphor for the criminal justice system. It's a metaphor for um, our businesses in, in, in communities that our goods are, are um, priced much more lower than they are actually worth. And so for me, this research has then um, evolved. We, you know, um, Biden has um, um, taken on a lot of this research. Um, his interagency task force on PAVE is about to release a report um, to the president later this month on appraisal um, um, or fixes to the uh, uh, appraisal area, let's hope. Um, I've um, worked alongside my colleagues, and, and, and uh, I just want to uplift Makeda Henry Nicky, who's not with uh, on this panel today. Um, she um, helped um, me in this Ashoka uh, collaboration that we're doing, and where we're looking at solutions. But um, part of the, that outgrowth, we helped 
um, um, Delegate Nick Childs of Prince George's County develop an entire housing agenda for the state of Maryland. And, and, and this is happening all over the country. Um, people are using our research to um, institute new policies and practices and procedures. The appraisal industry is, is changing as a result. And so, but, but I, I, I just go back to my first point. A lot of these issues would not have been brought to the fore without black people bringing it there. And, the, and we need to continue to diversify, to have the representation among all groups, um, um, or we're going to miss out on good, rigorous policy. Thank you, Andre. Um, thank you very much for that. We've been getting a lot of questions uh, from people and the, essentially the question is, um, I live in a community where uh, white people don't want to talk about racism. Um, and it's obvious in my community that, uh, you know, kind of the way the community is laid out physically, the kinds of opportunities that are available, uh, the way in which people, ways in which people conduct themselves uh, in public and private, it's very clear that racism continues to be an important issue. So the question is, how do I, or how do we in this community start this conversation about racism and get moving on policies that could uh, help create much greater equity in, in these communities? So this is a kind of a general, a general theme. So I am going to um, start off with Nicole uh, and then you know, please jump in as you see fit. So I'm probably the worst person to answer the first part of this question in terms of how you talk about racism with white people and should people of color be the first one to talk about it? I don't think so because I didn't create the problem. And I think it's really important that communities that are not black actually confront the problem of racism themselves. I think you have to actually have that conversation at your dinner tables. You have to have that conversation with your auntie and uncle. You have to have that conversation at your family reunion because people who have been affected or put in the position of being systemically discriminated cannot solve their own problem. And I think that's been the purpose of this whole conversation. How do you actually start talking about race? Well, if you are a person of color, if you're a black person like me, you know how you talk, start talking about race? You just be you <laughs> and you live your authentic self. I think what Andre is actually talking about is we, when I was in graduate school, finishing my PhD, it was actually on the black middle class. It was about the collective memory that black middle class people actually held. And what I found in my interviews is that black people's collective memory was not necessarily around their rich experiences that we celebrate every black history month. The people that invented the cotton gin, the people that invented and helped us, guided us out of slavery. We actually defined our existence on our ability to live in suburban neighborhoods among white peers and to go to certain schools and to have the type of economic liberation that we felt came along with being black. Well, guess what we're finding almost you know decades later after the civil rights movement that that's not the case that the same types of freedoms that we thought we had when we march on washington have actually been regressed so i would suggest to somebody that the issue of solving this problem has to start with you and for those of us that sit on the side we have to redefine and this is the part that i think is so interesting now that i, I actually do live in virginia and our governor is trying to retract critical race theory whatever that means but the challenge is is that the attacks on critical race theory have a lot to do with the attacks on who we think we are. And so I would say to that person that actually asked that question, it's not your responsibility to talk about race, it's your responsibility to be proud. And if you start there, that allows you to actually express yourself and to engage in productive conversations where people recognize that this is not your uh, supremacist or your, as, as some people who don't understand the definition of race, that this is not your way to actually be bigoted. It's your way of actually celebrating your history and yourself. With that being the case, I think Andre is right, um, Camille, and I'll just end here, that I think with the stage that we're in and what we do about this is we do need to go back to some tools. I applaud the Biden-Harris administration for placing equity at the center. It's a congressional initiative. It's an initiative of federal agencies. It's one in which fairness and equity is actually permeating this whole administration. But what we don't have, and I know you've written about this too, is a Carter Commission, some type of comprehensive approach of looking at all of the things that we discussed today and coming up with a body of solutions that will help us get there. We already know, for example, in the digital space, the civil rights of the 60s and accommodation law do not uh, actually apply to a digital universe where you can be tracked without anybody knowing. 
And so we've got to go back and really have these conversations, much like we tried to do with the Carter Commission. It wasn't a complete success, but it actually allowed us to be critical. And I think if anybody leaves this conversation, the biggest word that should stick out is critical thinking. It allowed us to be intellectual about our policies, about our, our circumstances, and about our future. And I think, again, one thing that I'm realizing, and I, I have kids and I share this with them all the time, that the loss of your presence in a room or in a conversation or in the intellectual discovery is the loss of this nation. And until people actually understand that we are contributors in that matter, I think it's important that a Kerner Commission might actually, you know, sort of suggest to people that the things that we're talking about have been long historical, have not been solved. And if you're going to actually value equity, you have to put a comprehensive framework around it. Andre, I don't know, the work that you're doing right now at Brookings is an attempt to actually get us back to that state of understanding the work you're doing with the NAACP. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but we definitely need something comprehensive that will allow us to really put the larger post-it note before us in solving these problems. Thanks, Nicole. So, Andre, your name was invoked. Um. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'll just add that um, we just entered a relationship with the NAACP where we will be producing data that will drive much of their campaigns. Um, you have two historic organizations um, founded within seven years of each other in the early 20th century. And, 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 I, all, and I brought this up at the, um, uh, the announcement um, th that at the time, um, the NAACP was fighting segregation uh, and, and housing issues for the most part, that was it, um, until the birth of the nation was premiered um, in the early 19th century, I mean, in the 20th century, and then they got on their first national campaign. Now, the, it ultimately failed, that campaign, but it, it elevated the NAACP as a national leader. But I posited that one of the reasons why it failed is because there were several research institutions that supported segregation, that supported um, racial bias, that you remember eugenics was the 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 uh, uh, method of the of the the time, and I don't want Brookings or any other think tank to be on the wrong side of history again, and so for me we do need to work together in this time with organizations that we have not worked with in the past. That adds the value. Um, we can no longer go into situations around policy, and I, and I bring this up about the Moynihan Report. Can you imagine if Black women were present when the, the Moynihan Report was really, it would not have come out the way that it did. It would not have. And so we cannot continue to operate in these silos that do not include worldviews that are central to the policies that we're discussing. Um, but, um, but I also just want to bring, one of the reasons why we have an achievement gap in this regard, we talk about the black white achievement gap, but there's truly an achievement gap around history in this country. We would know how to talk about race if people actually understood about uh, slavery, Jim Crow racism, redlining, the criminal justice thing, system, things that they should be getting in school. But you have this willful ignorance, literally in Florida, they're trying to pass a law that says, if my feelings are hurt, we, you cannot teach that. This is willful, the kind of willful ignorance that only goes towards a white supremacist exclusive society. And so for me, why we don't know how to talk about race, because people, and I'm not trying to like be um, mean spirited, but people are ignorant around these issues and they should not be. So for me, it's about demand quality education. <laughs> and that means having curricula that speaks to the nature of this country and the facts um, behind it. Yeah, but but Andre, I would say too, but we also, I mean, we're in a company of friends here, but we also have to talk about our history with our kids as well. We have to make that a priority in our own homes. 
As I mentioned in my dissertation research, we weren't prioritizing that because the goal of integration was actually the goal that many of us wanted to have. We didn't talk about what it meant to be uh, in existence before slavery, to debunk for our own families. And we have to do that as a parent. I'm constantly reminding my own kids who they are because that's the world in which we live. But I think Rashawn said it earlier, but we have to also remind ourselves as black people of our own resilience. We're still here. And that actually also helps us to better talk about race because the attacks that affront us and come before us are ones that we, yes, we take it personal every day, but we also know that we can get through this. So I just had to put that out there because I cannot rely upon history to go back and retrain my kids on things that they are not capable of doing. Great, thanks, Nicole, and thanks, Andre. Um, I wanna move really quickly to a range of questions we've gotten on reparations. And the general nature of the question is, you know, why aren't we moving forward on this? And what, what, what can we do to move forward on the question of reparations? Rayshawn, I'm gonna start with you. This is gonna be a quick round. Keon, you're gonna be next. And if we run out of time, then, then we run out of time, as all good conversations often do. Okay, I'll be real quick. I mean, look, we know that there's been a, a lot of work with HR 40. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Sheila Jackson Lee has been advancing that when it comes to thinking about restorative justice. Uh, Barbara Lee has been working on that in terms of truth and reconciliation. Andre and I, we've laid out a package. Um, essentially, it's a New Deal version for Black people to deal with tuition, to deal with, uh, with, with housing grants, and to also deal with business ownership. We also think that cash payments are wrapped up in that, but focusing on wealth building strategies becomes really, really important in this juncture. Now, on the front of why it's failing, I wanna make just, just three quick points. First, my grandfather always taught me that our silence is our acceptance. So what we need for the people who are saying, what do I do? We need for you to speak up. We need for you to create what I call brave spaces, what other people have called brave spaces, these spaces where you are willing to actually work as an accomplice and put, be willing to put your own privilege at risk in order to disrupt racism and discrimination. Part of that is a three-part system. First is to engage in what we're doing here, become a racial equity learner, to utilize academic research and policy reports, and then you're able to become a racial equity advocate and a racial equity broker, to hold your friends, family members, and coworkers accountable, and then to advocate for equitable policies, which includes restitution. If we wanna pay for reparations, the way we do it is through federally owned land. 25% of the land in the United States is federally owned. That gives back to the original 40 acres and a mule that black people never got. That land can be sold, it can be leased, and then you can take that money to actually fund a reparations program. We have a platform for it. We just need people in Washington to actually have the courage to do something about it. Thank you, Rayshawn. Keon, you have the last word, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to make it quick. I mean, part of the, you know, our conversation has really been focusing on not only issues and challenges, but ways that Black people have continued to resist. And so as Black people sort of both see themselves as the tax and paying the, the tax of racial inequity, we really sort of have to think about the strategies that become important in terms of what Black people need to do, not only to continue to uplift themselves, but also to sort of um, continue to figure out what, what are we going to participate in and what we're not going to participate in. Our earlier conversation about education one of the things that I think we, we've seen or trends is that Black people are deciding to not go to some of these large PWIs. They're, they're making decisions to go to HBCUs or they're making decisions to go to community colleges first to try to save money. And so I think the more of those kinds of strategies that become important, Black people are starting to understand, you know, not only their bodies, but sort of what they bring to the table and what they're willing and not willing to pay for. And I think those become where we start to really sort of enforce and engage people in terms of really thinking about what are the strategies for change. Thank you, Keon. And with that, I wanna thank uh, all of my fantastic panelists. Uh, and I also wanna thank a really engaged audience for tremendous questions and for joining us today. Um, we really, really welcome any comments that you will have on this or other issues. And we look forward to seeing you again here at Brookings.edu. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.